Hello, and thanks for tuning in to a previously recorded webinar. This webinar is brought to you by the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. I'm Billy Thomas, the host for the Forestry Webinar Series. After viewing this webinar, if you have any questions, please email us at forestry.extension at uky.edu and we will respond to your questions. Thanks again for watching this recorded webinar and please enjoy. Welcome. Billy Thomas with the UK Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. So glad to be with you all tonight. I've got two great presenters. We're going to be talking about citizen science apps and really how we can use it for forest engagement. So I've got with me both Dr. Ellen Crocker. Um, Ellen is with the Forest Health Center here at the UK Department of Forestry and Natural Resources and she works a lot with our extension team as well. Um, Dr. Crocker is a plant pathologist by training but she's also involved in a lot of the other activities and you'll hear about some of those here in just a little bit. And then I also have with us Mr. Nick Williamson. Nick is a coordinator of the Urban Forest Initiative here out of University of Kentucky. Um, Nick does a lot of work um, in the community. He also does some tree work here on campus as well. So Nick, so glad to have both you and Ellen with us. Great, glad to be here. Yeah. Now, I had a chance to preview your all's presentation a little bit earlier, and I must say there's a lot of content, a lot more than I realized, a lot more opportunities to be involved. Citizen science is a field that's been expanding and there's a lot out there. So hopefully tonight we can sift through some of that and give you some ideas of how you might want to incorporate it in the work that you do. All right, well, so without any further ado, we'll go ahead and get started with tonight's webinar again. Thank you all so much for being with us and I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you all. Thanks so much, Billy. Thanks, Billy. Yeah. Really appreciate it. So I'm excited about citizen science. Um, as a scientist, I think it's a great way to get more data, get better data. As an educator, I think it's a great way to connect to people in a different uh, manner than you might normally. And as a citizen, I think it can really empower individuals and communities to solve problems that affect their area. So let's look at our PowerPoint for today. So the first thing that we're going to do is just walk you through um, what citizen science is. And then we're going to profile some forest-related projects. I'll give you some examples of popular national projects, as well as one that I've been working on that's just recently been released called Tree Snap. And then Nick Williamson will talk about some of his work in citizen science with UK's Urban Forest Initiative. After that, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can find projects, if that's something you're interested in, or how you can start your own project um, to give you some tools for that. And then we'll take questions. So obviously, the, if you're all joining us here tonight, you're interested in citizen science, but what is citizen science? So, the truth is that that term has been used in a lot of different ways, and it means different things. It covers a really broad um, swath of different types of projects, different types of people, and um, goals. So a kind of overarching definition of citizen science would be scientific research conducted by non-professional scientists. So this could be in whole or in part. Um, scientists and or citizen scientists might play major roles. They might collect data, they might analyze data, um, but typically there's a collaboration with professional scientists. So those two groups working together. And from my perspective, this is one of the great strengths of citizen science, is that it's where professional scientists and non-professional scientists come together to solve problems. So and you can see here, the intersection of those two is kind of where you find citizen science. There are many different types of citizen science, and we're gonna go through some projects that you might be interested in, but citizen science covers everything from bioblitzes. If any of you have participated in bioblitzes before, uh, you know that these are days when parks or preserves, landowners, want to catalog the diversity that's present in a given area. 
So they'll invite people to come and catalog everything that they're seeing, all the different species, um, trees, plants, insects, reptiles, uh, fungi, and have a bio blitz to do that. It can be a great educational tool as well to bring in students and look at some of those species. There is also a lot of research projects that are led by professional scientists where they want citizen sciences help. They want uh, members of the, of the public to provide them with information, to connect them with data that they wouldn't have access to otherwise. And there's um, ways online to look for these as well as through uh, individuals in your community you might know. There's also educational expeditions. Some people like going on vacation to resorts. Other people might want to do research for a week uh, in the Patagonia uh, region or even here in the United States. Um, so there's Earthwatch Institute and other groups that have these intensive science in action um, uh, vacation uh, experiences. And these are just a few of the ways that non-professional scientists are involved in science and work with professional science scientists. So back to what is citizen science? What are some common characteristics of citizen science projects? First, anyone can participate. Not that everyone is qualified or has the background um, they might need for a particular project, but that it's open to the public. It's open to anyone. Second, these projects tend to follow a really detailed protocol. And that's because, as you can imagine, if you've got people in different parts of the country who aren't trained professionals uh, trying to add to a data set, it's really important that it's consistent. That if you're measuring a tree uh, in one way, you measure it in the same way. Um, so that's an important aspect of citizen science to make sure that the data that's coming from it is usable. Second or third, you want that data to be directly applied to real research questions or problems. This isn't always the case. Sometimes the goal of citizen science is really more engagement or outreach, but you do want that science aspect. You want to be testing a hypothesis or solving some problem. Um, and the data that is collected should be doing that. And finally, uh, many citizen science projects have regulations and policies regarding equitable access to data and findings. So uh, depending on the project, all of the data collected might be available to anybody online. The papers that are produced, any scientific manuscripts will be available to everyone. In other cases, that might not make as much sense. Maybe this is data that's um, personally identifying or, you know, is more important to keep private. But it's important to have some policy in place, making sure that if citizens are contributing to this project, they also have access to the information and the findings that are coming from it. So new technology has played a huge role in citizen science. Citizen science has been around for a long time, but if you've been hearing more about it, uh, Probably the reason for that is that the advent of new technologies, both um, the internet, uh, GIS technology, um, apps, web and uh, mobile devices, have just really expanded the number of people who can engage in really high quality scientific research. Before, if you wanted to connect people across the country to maybe report where they found uh, bird species, Everyone would have had to have a GPS device of some sort that can be expensive or hard to acquire. Um, how would you verify that information? And of course now, your phones all have GPS devices built into them. And you can easily snap a photo using something you carry around all day every day uh, to confirm the data that you've collected. So new technology has played a huge role. And in addition to kind of uh, just having access to those tools, um, being able to analyze massive amounts of data is one of the strengths of citizen science. So if you have people contributing information, many, many people will create a lot of data. And you need to have those computational tools, uh, which is another uh, advancement that's been made. So. If you're thinking, if you haven't participated in a citizen science project before, or you're trying to think about how you might want to do this with a group that you work with, um, or uh, students that you have, why would you be interested in it? So for citizen scientists that are participating in these projects, there are several advantages. 
The first is that it can help you solve a problem you care about, whether that's tree health or medical um, issues. Today we're talking about forests, but the world of citizen science in the medical field is also really important. So you can solve a problem that you care about personally. You can empower yourself and your community. Maybe no one else is looking at this issue, but it's really important. Um, you can pursue that and work with professional scientists to draw more attention to something. And then many of these projects are fun, social, and rewarding. So they might have a game component, or maybe you get to know other people in your community or area who are passionate about the same things that you are. Um, so for members of the public or wondering why should I be a part of the, these projects, these can all be driving factors. For professional scientists, there are a lot of advantages to uh, engaging with citizen scientists. First, you have the ability to collect and analyze more data from more places than you could ever do on your own. So there's just one of me, but if I'm able to benefit from many people who are also passionate about forest health, maybe we can do something even better. Um, and also, a lot of the areas that I have access to would be on public land, where, but most of Kentucky's forests are privately owned. So being able to work with woodland owners um, is a big advantage. Second, it's a way to connect the public, uh, show them why they're important and why the work that I'm doing is important as well. And then third, scientists, you know, we all have similar training, we all think a certain way. And sometimes that's good, but sometimes it really limits us. And by working with citizen science, we can really benefit from different perspectives and backgrounds and strengths. And I think that these are all reasons driving uh, why professional scientists want to work with citizen scientists in a variety of capacities. For educators, citizen science can also be a great tool. So it can help you better engage students and teach new skills in a hands-on setting. In addition, there are other ways that citizens are engaging in science. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but just for example, you might have heard of crowdsourcing. So uh, Kickstarter or something like that, getting crowdfunding for a scientific project is a thing that exists. So you can go to uh, experiment.com or other places and browse scientific projects that are out there. Maybe support them if you want. I was looking online and found this uh, project for Emerald Ash Borer. Um, obviously, this is only going to be a small component of a research project, but it's a way to be involved in research that's happening. There's also different types of crowdsourcing, so it's not just getting funding, but also um, data or tools, resources from, from a large group of people using social media and other um, um, online techniques, so crowd mapping, mapping uh, different areas of land. Um, so that's something you may have heard of, another way for members of the public to be engaged in science. So let's say you're interested in joining a project, or maybe you're working with a group or some students that are interested in doing some citizen science. Before you begin, here are some tips that I have. First, review the projects that are out there. Maybe go online to some of the um, platforms that I'll mention and just look through uh, what different people are doing. What looks exciting to you? Hopefully that will help you determine what kind of thing do you want to be doing. Do you want to be assessing water quality or air quality? Do you want to be reporting different species that are present to get a better idea of biodiversity? Do you want to work on a really targeted research project that um, tests a particular hypothesis? And how do you want to engage with professional scientists? Do you want this to be something that you're really spearheading? Or do you want to fit into an ongoing project? So those are all things to consider. And then also what's feasible for you or the group that you're working with? Do you want to be outside most of the time? Do you want to be online at your computer? Um, will the students that you're working with be more engaged if something has a game component? Um, those are all things to keep in mind. And if you are an educator, uh, there's some great resources online. Uh, California Academy of Sciences, for example, has a uh, syllabus of what to do with students. If you've got a group of students or a group that you're working with, how to choose your own citizen science project. 
So different uh, approaches to doing that, letting the, uh, the, the students that you're working with look through projects and pick one and then conduct it and reflect on that. Um, that could work in a really wide variety of settings. So there are some great resources available. If you want to join a project, there are so many to choose from. Here you can see some, some images, everything from the showerhead microbiome project to assess the bacteria in your showerhead to finding new galaxies in the universe to looking at how um, RNA works to find better drugs and medicine to testing your cat's personality. Mm -hmm. And all of these are legitimate uh, citizen science projects that I found looking around online. So, you know, it can be hard to know where to start. But today we're talking about forests. So I'm just going to rush you through a few examples of some of the types of projects that are out there, um, just to give you some context for what's out there and, and what you might be interested in. So historically, citizen science and birding have gone hand in hand. Cornell's Lab of Ornithology and the Audubon Society have really driven a lot of fantastic research and a lot of um, engagement with the public. So people, non-professional scientists doing amazing work and really answering some questions related to birds. Um, so there are so many projects to choose from related to, um, to birds and citizen science. Uh, one that I wanted to just mention because it's coming up soon is the annual Christmas bird count. So if that's something you're interested in, you can go to the audubon.org uh, Christmas bird count page. And every year this is something that's been happening for, for a century. So not all citizen science is high tech. Some of it, you know, is, is more low tech. Um, and this is one example of that, but it's still a great way to engage uh, with a knowledgeable uh, experts on birds. So if you were to join this, you would find a um, advanced birder in your area and uh, work with them to complete the survey. So that's one option related to birds. There's a lot of projects related to air and water quality, if that's something that um, you want to focus on. Uh, for example, there are publicly uh, available air sensor toolboxes that you can use and then contribute information to the EPA on air quality. Here in Kentucky, there's Watershed Watch, um, where you can assess the quality of water. And the way to do that is to go to the Division of Water webpage and find your region and click on it. You'll see the same map there. So you would just click on that, find the coordinator for your area, and let them know that you're interested in this kind of project. You want to know how you can get trained in that and uh, how you can start uh, sampling. So there's lots of opportunities that are out there. Um, just uh, a matter of finding them. Another way that citizen science projects have been connected to uh, forests is through um, phenology or plant timing. So one of those projects that I found was Project Bud Burst, where people report when plants are flowering, when leaves are, uh, when plants are leafing out. Um, and that's a data set that's been contributed for a long time, but maybe it's something you want to know as well. How is that changing over time? Are your trees flowering earlier than they used to? Um, so that's another uh, project that you could check out. Related to tree health, which is something I care about a lot personally, as Billy mentioned, I work with the UK's Forest Health Research and Education Center, and my background is in pathology. So there are several uh, projects that you could tap into there. A couple examples are a tree's life, looking at urban uh, red maples and assessing their growth over time with different stressors. If you've got any kids or you work with children, a great project I'd recommend is the Backyard Bark Beetles Project, where um, you make your own beetle trap using a two liter soda bottle and hand sanitizer and collect bark beetles, which are very, very tiny um, but you can see them in the hand sanitizer and then send them to a national lab that will identify them and add them to a database of different bark beetles where they're present. 
There are a lot of different projects that involve monitoring particular species. And if birds aren't your thing, um, there's several butterfly related projects. Uh, the Monarch Larvae Monitoring Project, the Caterpillars Count Project. Really, we could go on and on like that for a long time because there are so many fantastic programs out there. Um, but one that I'm a big fan of and I would really like to pitch your way um, is iNaturalist. And iNaturalist is a great uh, tool. It's a phone app that you can use to identify species and report them. So if you see something, you can add to a map for your area of what's present there, but it's also a tool to help you figure out what that is. So people have used this in a wide variety of ways. Um, unlike some other projects, it's not connected to a particular research program, but for example, neighborhoods have used it to do their own bio blitzes, so survey the diversity that's present uh, in their area. I believe Floor Cliff Preserve um, right here in Kentucky has used um, iNaturalist for their bio blitz. Um, and so you should check that out if you haven't already. And the way that works is I've got a little video here I'll show you. When you sign in, it'll take a moment to load, but you've got your observations listed. You can keep track of what you've seen in the past, which you might enjoy. And then you'll go to your area. Here I am on campus at UK, and you can see all these markers on the map. Those are other observations from other people, a chipmunk, a red-tailed hawk, um, everything that they've been seeing, a burr oak. So people uh, can add to that data set and it creates a community around that. One of the best tools is being able to identify things. So you can take a photo of something. Here I am in my office just taking a photo of an old preserved mushroom that I have sitting around. If you know me, you know I like fungi. Um, so I take that photo and then ask, what did you see? And it will use a machine learning algorithm to match that photo to millions of other photos in its database to try to figure out what species it is. It's not always right, it's not always in the ballpark, but here you can see it got it pretty well. It is indeed a chanterelle. It's a smooth chanterelle, so it's on the list that it provides, but so are a lot of other species, including some poisonous ones. So it's not perfect, but I think it's a really fantastic tool for figuring out more about your natural world, what's around you, um, for educating yourself, for engaging with other people, um, other members of your community who are contributing that kind of thing, and then even building your own data set for what you see um, in your area. So there's a lot of pros to iNaturalist and some other similar apps in that they're good for IDing species, for bio blitzes, for learning more about your area and connecting to a community. But one of the downsides is that most of the data doesn't actually get used by professional scientists. So thinking of that, I want to tell you about an app that I've been working on in a citizen science program that I've been working on called TreeSnap um, that really takes the, a different approach and thinks about um, what are problems that are out there that scientists are having and how can we solve those by connecting scientists to citizen scientists. So TreeSnap is um, a mobile app and for submitting observations of trees. Here you can see uh, there are five trees that we highlight, American chestnut, ash, hemlock, white oak, and American elm. But you can also report on any other tree you see. The reason we selected these trees is that we're working with professional scientists who have ongoing research and they want your data, they want answers about um, those species. Most of those are species that have been negatively affected by invasive insects and diseases. Um, that have come in and basically wiped them out. So we worked with restoration tree breeding programs who want to find, for example, American chestnut that are resistant to the chestnut blight that wiped them out many years ago. Groups like the American Chestnut Foundation who have um, programs that are looking for those trees that are still healthy, that have some genetic resistance so that we could try to reintroduce them in different areas. So. We have both the app for submitting observation of those trees. And there's a website, treesnap.org, for accessing that data. So that could be your own data, um, as well as a way to let those professional scientists have access to the data. People can record information about trees, the location, using your phone's built-in GPS, photos, different characteristics that our partners care about, and then 
for, um, they'll be used in breeding programs or in research programs by those professional scientists. And we built in a way for them to directly contact the citizen scientists, but that protects everybody's privacy and uh, data. So right now it's available for Android and iPhone and it's free for the public. And it's a collaboration of the University of Kentucky, the University of Tennessee, uh, U.S. Forest Services, Southern Research Station, and the Forest Health Research and Education Center. Uh, myself, Bradford Conan, Abdullah al Saeed, Bert Abbott, Dana Nelson, and Meg Statton. And our partners are um, the U.S. Forest Service. They have elm and ash uh, research programs and breeding programs um, for ash, trying to find trees that are resistant to the emerald ash borer. Um, for elm, uh, trees that are resistant to Dutch elm disease. The American Chestnut Foundations uh, work trying to find uh, chestnuts in the wild. Hemlock breeding and research programs with the Forest Restoration Alliance and Hemlock Restoration Initiative. Hemlock, of course, has really been killed by the Hemlock woolly adelgid, and these programs are both trying to restore it in our landscape and long term. And then also a white oak breeding program here at the University of Kentucky with the Forest Health Research and Education Center that's just getting up and running. And this program takes a more proactive approach. While we're fortunate that nothing currently is uh, hurting white oak on a wide scale in the same way that it is for those other species, if something were to be introduced, we want to be ahead of the game. So getting more information uh, about white oak so that we can be prepared. So many of these programs already had ways for the public to be citizen scientists and be part of their program. So they maybe had paper forms that you could mail in, um, report different trees. Um, of course, you did have to have a GPS and write in that information. And so what we did is we brought all of that information to one place and made it easier and more accessible. So here I'll walk you through how that works. Here is the Tree Snap app. You can see that there are different species listed there. Um, I clicked on American chestnut, and you can see that there's a GPS um, uh, location accuracy at the bottom happening automatically. There are lots of different things to enter. You can take a photo of the tree. You answer all these questions that were provided to us by the American Chestnut Foundation, our partner, um, so that they can know is this tree resistant to chestnut blight? What are its characteristics? Is it healthy? Um, information that they want for their research program. So you'd go through and answer these questions. Um, there's also educational information. If you've got a question about maybe what is diameter or maybe what a chestnut looks like, there are ID photos of leaves and other features. So we tried to make this app as easy and user-friendly as possible, um, provide all the information you would need to successfully participate um, in that research program. But of course, this could be used by anyone, not just uh, the American Chestnut Foundation. So that data would be available to other researchers and other projects. Um, so it's not just for chestnut. You can look at um, other species as well. Here, white oak, a similar structure. Um, taking photos, answering questions. Um, you can also report information on any trees you want. And you could just use that for your own purposes if you wanted to have a better record of trees or if you're um, monitoring them for some purpose, um, as well as contributing to professional scientist databases. So once you use the app to contribute that data, you can go online to, to treesnap.org and you'll be able to see all of that on the map. So here's our main page. You can learn a little bit more about TreeSnap, what it is, and who we are. And we really tried to make this as transparent and open as possible, um, with the exception that we're, um, we have some high quality data. So all of these people, if you're tagging trees on your own personal property, you don't want everyone to know. So you can see for privacy reasons, the location of those trees are fuzzed. So you'll see a little question mark. And that means that the exact location isn't available to the public, but it is available to our scientist partners because we want to protect your trees from timber theft and other problems. So you can see a map here with different observations of trees that people have contributed. Um, the photos there. You can also um, edit that. 
So if you just wanted to see ASH, it's pretty easy to curate that data and um, see those different species that people have reported. So since its release, the tree snap was just released. Uh, tree snap was just released in July of 2017, and we currently have about 150 registered users, 200 observations, and uh, observations from 13 states. What we really want is we want more people using tree snap. Uh, we want more people contributing data for our partner organizations and testing it out, and letting us know what works and what doesn't. We just, um, you know, we're, we're doing this for the first time, so we want to make sure that this app works for um, you. So if you're interested, if this is the kind of project you would be excited about, please give it a try, uh, download the app, and let me know uh, how it's working for you. So after that little pitch, I'm going to um, check our chat box to see if we have any questions. Let's see. Any questions before we move on? Well, I'll keep thinking of them and keep them in mind. We'll stop for questions again soon. And with that, I want to transition um, to Nick Williamson, our next speaker. So Nick works with UK's Urban Forest Initiative and is involved in a really wide range of projects, uh, among them some exciting citizen science projects that he can tell you about today and um, how you could learn more about how to do that. Right, Nick? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, thanks for being with us. Oh, yeah, I'm glad to be here. Um, so that was awesome. I really want to do the micro shower uh, <laughs> citizen science. That sounds really interesting. Or maybe terrifying if you do it and are thinking, oh my gosh, all of that is living in my shower. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, so I suppose I'm, I'm here and I'm going to talk a little bit more about sort of narrowing it down into um, more of forest, urban, specifically urban forest related projects. And so to do that, I think I'll start by, um, by uh, sort of a, a pitch, if you will, on the organization that, that I work for, uh, which is called the Urban Forest Initiative, um, which is based here at the University of Kentucky uh, in the College of Agriculture. And uh, we've been in operation since 2014. Um, we're, our founders are Drs. Mary Arthur, who's a forest ecologist, and Dr. Lynn Risky Kinney, who's a forest entomologist, uh, both here at the university. And so, um, essentially, what what we do, similar to citizen science, you you may have heard um, urban forestry as a sort of buzzword that's been start starting to have been thrown around a little more often. Uh, so in a nutshell, we are involved, the Urban Forest Initiative is involved with education and outreach. Um, and we do that through K through 12 education and tree curricula. Um, we use campus, uh, primarily UK campus, as a living and learning laboratory. And we're also involved with community engagement. And so on this top slide, you can see um, one of our two full-time employees, Grace Coy, uh, doing some outreach to some youth. She's demonstrating the ecosystem benefit of stormwater interception um, to some children using a mop and a sponge, which were put together to represent a tree. And, um, a, j a mason jar full of water, which represents a rain cloud raining on that tree. In the middle, you see a, an image of a UK students participating in an event we started three years ago now called Mulch Madness. Um, and so uh, what we found is that um, spreading mulch uh, not only is uh, therapeutic, but it seems to be a fun um, activity that people enjoy. Who, who would have known that uh, spreading mulch around trees is 
is um, enjoyable and people really get into this. Uh, on the bottom, we most recently um, had the first of our series of seminar speakers come and uh, so you, this is Dr. Susan Day from Virginia Tech who came to UK and gave a public talk about urban soil rehabilitation and soil issues that we have in in um, cities and in towns. And so we do community engagement through these seminar series and we do adult education and community education through workshops which Dr. Ellen Crocker is heavily involved with and and facilitates. Um, so these are the three sort of prongs that that um, the Urban Forest Initiative, and if you hear me say UFI, that is our sort of acronym. So if I stumble and you you hear the word UFI, uh, that's that's who I'm referring to. So that's my uh, shameless plug on the Urban Forest Initiative. I realize that um, many of you are outside of the Central Kentucky bluegrass inner bluegrass region and probably have never heard of um, the Urban Forest Initiative. So that's who we are. And now I'm going to get into a few of the specific projects that I think um, relate specifically to citizen science. Because really what we found out is that, um, you know, we're talking about urban forestry, but um, urban and community forestry is just as much about people as it is about trees. Um, you know that 80% of people living in the United States live in a city. And so more often than not, the forest that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis is um, surrounded by sidewalks and streets and the places that we live and work and play. So uh, I'm going to refer primarily to these three websites. Um, I'll try and share, I'll try and remember to share the addresses in the chat box as I'm going through so that you could look at these websites on your computer or note them down and, and look at them later. And also, if I'll bring up this chat box, if, if there's any confusion on the speed that I'm operating at or um, what you see, it's probably because I'm going to try and do a live sort of demonstration. So anyway, if there's any, if I'm talking too fast, moving too fast, please just tell me to slow down or, or stop or put, enter your questions. So we'll start with uh, iTree. And let me share the screen here. So hopefully everybody is, is seeing what I'm seeing. Can you let Nick know if you can see iTree? Uh, someone please type it into the chat box and we'll pass on that information. Great, we see one yes, so. Excellent. Okay, so, um, if you haven't, thank you for chiming in there. That, that really helps. Um, so if you haven't been exposed to iTree before, um, I would recommend you, you take a look at this. Um, essentially, iTree is a, a software suite. And so there is a bunch of different web applications that are available to use as part of the iTree software. Um, and conveniently, iTree on the home page, they've, they've, you know, the, they have this heading, which tool should I use? So this is going to kind of help you determine how and, and why and when you should use which different feature that iTree offers. Um, I should back up and, and say that iTree was developed in a partnership between the U.S. Forest Service. Um, several arborist and tree companies, Davy Tree, Arbor Day Foundation, the International Society of Arboriculture, um, the Society of Municipal Arborists and Casey Trees. And so this, this software suite is a, is a joint collaboration from all those different entities. And the main usage or idea behind the, the iTree package is that 
it gives you the ability to ascribe um, ecosystem services in both monetary values and environmental values to urban forests as a whole and to individual trees in the urban forest. And so an example of an ecosystem service would be stormwater interception. Um, and so uh, energy conservation is another one. Um, home values. There's all sorts of different ecosystem benefits. So I kind of figured maybe a good way to demonstrate this is to run through a quick demonstration of one of the programs that I've used. I'm not familiar with every single one of these applications, but I've used a few extensively. And uh, one of the ones that I, that I like a lot is called iTree Design. Um, so iTree Design, first I should start by saying, is useful for when you're looking at individual trees or a small number of trees. So not large scale forest systems, more like the trees around your house, around your school, around your neighborhood, places like that. So a quick sort of fly through an iTree design. Um, I'm just gonna demonstrate the Thomas Poe Cooper building. And I'm, I'm gonna go way too fast for you to catch everything. So come up with some questions and save, save those or, or ask them as we move through. So I'm going to put in the T.P. Cooper um, address, the, the address to the forestry building here on UK campus where we are currently sitting. I'm going to say go. Google Maps is going to help me locate that, that address. And here we are. So iTree Design has put us fairly close to the Thomas Poe Cooper forestry building, which is right here. So iTree Design is really, its neatest feature I think is that you're able to outline the structure, the building that you're interested in, um, in looking at e the trees surrounding and the ecosystem benefits that those trees provide. And so I'm going to do a very quick and rough outline of our building, which those of you who know this building know that it is not shaped like that but you get the idea. Um, design is gonna ask us when the structure was built. If it's pre-1950 or post-1950, the T.P. Cooper Dairy Building was, um, I, I think it's 1930 something. And so we'll say yes, pre-1950, The we're, we have both heating and air conditioning, though some would argue on the effectiveness of, of both of those. So we have our building outlined. Um, step two is we're gonna place our trees around this building. So the way this works is you would need to um, actually go out and measure those trees. Um, I know that we have a, a hemlock tree, an eastern hemlock which is very close to the side of the building. Window. Thanks, Alan. Tree, tree diameter is 11 inches. So I'm, I'm realizing I need to speed this up a bit. But it's really neat because iTree gives you this uh, tree benefits zone, which they've deemed as the maximum zone of, of benefits that we get surrounding this structure. So you go through and, and identify every single tree within this zone around the building and do a little cooking demonstration here. We've actually already done that. And so um, we have a file here. It's really important to save your data in iTree because if not, you lose everything. So we've gone through and, and identified every single tree within that zone of benefits surrounding the forestry building. And um, the neat feature that we can do is we can estimate benefits and so there's all these allometric equations built into the backbone of all of the iTree software that have to do with tree growth, uh, leaf area, biomass. And so just from having the diameter of this tree, iTree is able to estimate all these ecosystem benefits. So we'll, we'll say we're 
going to look 50 years out and see what the benefits of the tree, trees around T.P. Cooper are. So this seems like a great tool, Nick. Is this what you've used um, for your work with the Urban Forest Initiative on campus? We have, yeah. We've, we've used this uh, fairly extensively. Um, and I'll show that in just a minute. Do we want to leave 10 minutes or so for questions or longer? I think we'll, we'll probably go up until um, uh, 55 after. Okay. And then um, if you'd like to stay after and listen to questions, we'll be here uh, chatting away. So we'll, we'll talk about citizen science uh, for a while. I certainly will if you let me. So. Cool. OK, so we have, we, we've done all our calculations, and we have um, our ecosystem benefits showing up. So we have our list of trees, which is 22 trees surrounding the forestry building. Um, we can see that these trees are, are contributing $530 this year. And how are they doing that? You use these tabs up here. Um, so we're going to talk about in liters here. We have 117,000 liters of stormwater this year. Of energy conservation, air quality, and um, carbon dioxide sequestration. So these are just some of the ways that, that this tool is, is interesting. You can look out into a future year and see what the benefits would be there, um, total to date benefits. So it's really kind of a neat, a neat little program. Um, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on because we're, we're running kind of long here. So next I'm going to talk about the Urban Forest Initiative uh, webpage, and, and Ellen just asked how, how or if we're actually using iTree, and one way we're using that is through a student project. So I'm navigating here to, to our website, um, and you can see that we have an interactive map of the trees on UK campus on our website. Um, so there's over 6,000 trees here on main campus. And um, these buildings that are sort of highlighted in orange are buildings that we've actually had students go out to and measure the trees with, in the field. So measure the diameter and, this, and collect the species of these trees and then bring that data back to the, to the classroom and plug it, plug it all into iTree design. And so we're, we're looking at the tree benefits to different buildings on campus over the next 40 years. So this is a really neat, this fits in with citizen science, I think, because we're having, you know, students collect data and um, bring it back and plug it in and figure out what our trees are doing for us here on campus. Nick, you've done this with UK students, but certainly you could do this with um, other in other contexts. Absolutely. Yeah, you could do this for your own house if you want to look at uh, trees around your house. Um, it's a great classroom project, I think, and, and I think it's transferable to high school, probably even middle school students. Um, your work, how about your work? What are the trees around your work doing? You could look at that too. Um, okay, so I guess the, the last thing I want to talk about is you'll see on this map that we have every little dot represents a tree on campus. And um, you can see that there's three colors of dots. If you look really closely, you probably have to look, get your eyes right up next to the screen. Um, you can see that there's a darker green dot and a lighter green dot that's con uh, sorry, evergreen and deciduous <laughs> trees. And you see these blue dots too. Uh, the blue drop dots represent trees that have been adopted on UK campus. And so um, I'd, I'd like to take a minute to talk to, about our Adopt-A-Tree program and, and another useful um, web app that, that I think sort of fits very well with the citizen science theme. Um, so we came up with this adopt a tree, and you've probably heard that phrase before. A lot of times adopt the trees are, are based on donation or, or um, you know, have a plaque next to a tree in an arboretum or something like this. But uh, we really wanted to make a, a icebreaker activity to get people who 
maybe don't think about trees in. <laughs> get them in and get them thinking about the trees that are around them, what trees are important to them, and the ecosystem benefits that those trees provide. So I just quickly want to share that we have on our website, you can see the we have a packet that sort of describes the project, um, the how to, the when, the why, and the how. Um, the tools you need, again, I've um, mentioned several times that these little devices that we carry around all the time have lots of power and can, can do lots of work for us. So really the only other thing than a phone uh, would be a tape measure. Uh, similarly to the iTree software suite, there's a really nice tool called the National Tree Benefits Calculator, which we utilize for this adopter tree portion. And I'm not going to run through how to use this. Again, we're, we're sort of short here on time. But the National Tree Benefits Calculator is a simplified version of iTree. And it gives you the same sort of ecosystem benefits that you would get from using iTree. Um, so I guess I just, I'll just finish out here. didn't realize that I would talk this slow. <laughs> But um, there's a lot to talk about. There is, isn't there? Yeah. Um, just finish out with a, with a fun story here. So, in doing this project on UK campus, uh, we work. I, I work a lot with UK students, of course. And um, what I found through this Adopt a Tree program, which I neglected to mention, is that other, um, apart from the ecosystem benefits that we get from the um, from the National Tree Benefits Calculator, we also ask the person who's adopting a tree to give their reasoning as to why they adopted this tree. And I think this is really important and also sort of, I don't know, maybe fits well with this, I, this citizen science idea and getting people involved. And what we found is that people's reasoning, reasons for adopting trees seldom have, have much to do with the amount of rainwater that tree intercepts or the energy that that tree can conserves um, but people like nature and trees for for other reasons right and so i bring up uh, shanice who is a gen 100 student and just so you can sort of get a get an idea as to why why shanice appreciated this eastern red bud i think it's important to keep sort of this stuff this kind of stuff in mind when we're doing citizen science is that uh, the social aspect. I mean, people, Ellen mentioned this, that people want to get involved who are passionate and interested and, um, and uh, want, want to become more knowledgeable themselves. And so, um, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of what, what citizen science is, is all about. Um, so. Thank you, Nick. That's, that's wonderful. And a lot of fantastic uh, citizen science projects that you could um, use uh, in different contexts and um, uh, benefit from. I think sure. Urban yeah. urban trees, as you mentioned, are are uh, increasingly the way that people see trees in their daily lives. So having those kinds of projects is great. So here's Nick's contact. Um, if you would like to follow up with him, thank you, Nick. And. As we wrap up, I just want to speed through this to leave us some time for a few questions. If you're interested in starting a citizen science project, so some issue that you're passionate about and want to start a project, there are best practices guides that are available online. And one of those is a crowdsourcing toolkit from uh, the federal government. Um, basically, it walks you through how do you do that? First, you scope out your problem, you design a project, you build your community, so both professional and non-professional scientists. You manage your data, and then you sustain and improve it over time. Um, in addition, there's a fantastic uh, citizen science toolkit available um, that walks you through that same process in a bit more detail. How do you form your team, uh, refine your protocols, uh, and eventually uh, measure effects and disseminate those results that you're getting? Um, so that's if you're interested in starting your own project. If you're interested in finding a project to participate in, um, there are a lot of different platforms online. A couple that I would refer you to are uh, Zooniverse and, and SciStarter. 
Um, they have lots of different citizen science projects that you can look through, get ideas from, and uh, then join. So in addition to those two, we here at UK have our own citizen science network uh, that's just getting started, FERN, the Forest uh, Education and Research Network. Um, if you're interested in joining, the way it works is that we'll email you pretty rarely, but whenever a researcher here has a project that they want citizen science, science citizen scientists help with. So um, if that's something you're interested in joining, please email me and I'll add you to the list. And when something comes up, we will shoot you an email and give you that opportunity. So with that, um, I just want to thank all of you for joining us tonight to talk about citizen science and uh, see what questions you have. Thank you for watching this previously recorded webinar. Should you have any questions about the webinar you just viewed, please email forestry.extension at uky.edu. And for more information about forestry and wildlife in Kentucky, please visit us online at www.ukforestry.org. Thanks so much.